You know, it's amazing that sometimes we think that everything's breaking down around us, don't we? <laughs> that nothing's going to plan. And then all of a sudden we realize, I need God. So if you feel comfortable when things are only a certain way, I encourage you when they start falling apart, cling to Jesus. Because today we're going to start talking about not money. Because some of you are like, it's the end of the year. The preacher's going to preach about money and giving. Because it's tax season is coming to a close. No, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. What I'd like to talk about is a treasury that doesn't have any money in it. A treasury that if it did have money in it, it would take up every single cash deposit around the whole world. And then it wouldn't be able to actually um, be counted. Because if God owned everything, how could you catalog that? Have you ever tried to think about how much money God has? Have you ever tried to think about how much God owns? As a child, I used to try and think about it, and my mind would go wandering off, and you know, about 10 minutes later, you come back down to earth, and you're like, where was I? You start thinking about all the things that God's created, and then you just start to do one thing, and that's start to count the stars. Have you ever sat out on a night where there's no city lights around and stared up into that giant expanse up there? One person told me, hey, what if you're wrong and that's actually down? I looked up in the sky and felt my body lifting from the earth. Not really, but it felt like it because sometimes the perspective that we have is so me-centered. Is it not? So today I'd like to take a break from that me-centeredness and talk about heaven. Talk about the things that were a little bit different than the stuff we see all around us every day. The holidays, it seems like there's a little bit of heaven because our family's right near us, or uh, we're able to kind of put our minds toward God this time of year. Um, but I would like us to look at the treasury of heaven and see something a little bit new today. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 6 and put your finger there because we're going to go to right to the center of a sermon, a sermon preached by Jesus, and it's right in the middle of it. Just put your finger there. All right? And then I need to tell Samantha Herb uh, that you will come see me in my office afterward because you won the, the counting of the songs last week. Uh, there was actually a few more than you counted, but uh, you were the one with the, the most out of the ones that I had mentioned. And uh, there was even one that I went back over the sermon and realized that I did say something about conversations, and that is a Sarah Groves um, song. So, uh, good catch. But uh, if you'd come to me in my office after we have something for you. Let's bow our heads as we open God's word today. Father in heaven, we know that when Jesus came here to earth, that it was a messy place, but that you cared immensely about your people, and you wanted to give us something that would last in not only the minds and the hearts of people, but last for generations. A message that could be told to the world and it would appeal to everyone. So dear Father, as we open your scripture today, we pray that you will open our hearts and minds. And dear Father, not only that, open our lives. Open the things that we do. Open everything up. And dear Father, change us. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was contemplating over this last week, as children are looking with, you know, enthusiasm... Maybe that's not the right word. You know, the, the day of the year that you, um, you can get children out of bed sometimes begrudgingly all week, and especially on the weekends, they might get up a little bit early. But on Christmas morning, I don't know what it is, um, children have this built-in clock that says Christmas presents or say that let's wake up mom and dad, um, sometimes as early as 4 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it's just the way it is. Other days, you can't wake them up. Um, the season, you know, is sometimes uh, kind of cluttered because we think of gifts and everything this time of year. But then as an adult, you start looking around you and you look at this time of year, starting with Thanksgiving, going all the way to the darkest part of the year, which was last Sabbath and then the new year. You start to realize that the holidays have absolutely nothing to do with some of the stuff that we put around them. But the holidays have to do with people. 
And from what I've studied this week, I have found out that the Sermon on the Mount is basically blaring in our face that we've got it all wrong. That the most important thing in the Bible for us to realize is that we are the children of God and that he wants us to focus on people. So those of you who are watching today, um, I wish that you would come visit us because you're our family that's extended. We care about you immensely. And some of you, I know you're a couple states away. So if you're on vacation, you can come see us too. But um, today, as we kind of open this, this sermon, I hope that it will touch your heart because I found out this week that treasure has absolutely nothing to do with what you unwrap. I found out treasure is something that you don't deposit in a bank. I found out this week that treasure is something that you can't count with a calculator. But treasure is something that is a gift from God. And it's you. As we look at Matthew 6, it's an interesting chapter. This time of year, we start reflecting on the last part of this year, and we start looking back. We look back on our lives, and we also look forward. We take an evaluation of our lives this time of year, and we make plans or promises, do we not? I mean, after you eat all that food from Thanksgiving till Christmas, you have to make yourself some promises. Otherwise, we may not make it to the next holiday. It just feels that way, does it not, sometimes? How many of you have eaten at least a dessert a day for three or four days? Some of you are like, what's dessert? I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor. <laughs> it seems this time of year, all the delicacies that we grew up with, all the things that remind us of our past, the things that we like, all of a sudden, we like to look for them. In fact, this is the time of year that even fruitcake comes out, and some of you are like, ew. But there are people that like fruitcake. It is something that is nostalgic, something that tastes good to them. And I could go through each family and I could ask you what your special dessert is and things like that. But really, really what matters as we evaluate our lives and make plans and promises to lose weight or exercise or do all of the above, we want to wipe the slate clean from last year, don't we? Not that it was a bad year. But we want to start over and invent something new. That's who we are as humans. We like to look at the next thing that's going to happen. Happen. We like to start over again. And we like to do things again. And do it better. That's just how we are as humans. So I'd like to look at the text in the middle of the sermon preached by Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount. It gives us a great picture of where not only our hearts need to be. But our whole selves. Can I say that again? Our heart represents our emotion, our brains represent our intellect, but there's something more to us. Is there not? There's more than just our mind and our emotions. So when we look at the Bible today, I would like us to put all of it in. Say, hey, that I'm going to put everything into it right now. Not that Pastor Nelson has you know, the best sermons on the planet. But if we put everything in toward God, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us in a way that maybe he hasn't spoken to you before. He's going to spoke, speak to the pre preacher too up front and say, listen, you need to say this or do this. Sometimes even on the cuff. So, the question this morning is, what if your heart was a treasure chest? Picture it. I didn't bring one today because I don't have one. Be nice. Call myself a pirate. <laughs> but a big tre treasure chest full of things that are valuable. Some of you, you're already starting to click through it. Mm, gems, uh, gold, uh, silver. Uh, you know, you're starting to go through your mind. But a big chest full of things that are worth a lot to you. Now, I know sometimes you can't throw people in there, but if, go with me. Are, are some of the people in your life really important to you? You wouldn't want to put them in that treasure chest, but they are, in fact, part of that treasure chest of your life. Where would you put God in this whole situation? We say first, we do, and we mean it. But where is God in your life? 
Let's say we have a nation that has occupied us and we're paying almost all the nation's um, GDP to that nation. Uh, people are doing okay if they listen to the occupying force, but still we're owned and operated by what? Not us. Wouldn't that be strange? We're like, we're Americans, we're free. We don't answer to anybody. But the story that Jesus is preaching comes from an occupied territory. When he is preaching this sermon, you have to realize that the people are looking around them and seeing the Roman occupiers all around them, and they're going, wait a minute, okay, Jesus is going to preach about treasure? Shh, Jesus, the Romans are here. They're going to take taxes, and the taxes are really steep. Shh, Jesus, don't talk about things like this. And then Jesus preaches this sermon, and right in the middle of it blows them away because we find out it's not money. So an occupied territory. Jesus is preaching to a crowd that wants freedom. They want freedom from Rome and the, the leaders of Israel too because they're kind of bought off. But Jesus is not a radical like we think he is. When he preaches and lives the life that he does serving others, he tells us that he's not a politician, but he's a real life, life-based person that does real things like you and I. How many of you, like me, when you read the Bible, think that it's way in the past? I mean, I will admit it. And you're like, ah, the history of the Bible, yeah. When Jesus is preaching, I can maybe picture it, but I picture people in sandals and they're kind of simple. They don't think the same way I do. Am I off, am I off base this morning? They're a little more not advanced as we are. And so I look back and I, I hear the sermon that Jesus is about to preach. And I'm like, ah, these people, they won't really understand it too much. It's not really, you know, one of those sermons. And then I started unpacking it. Open with me to Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 1. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Whoa, Jesus. I came in in the middle of a sermon. I realized that. But wow, Jesus, this is kind of deep. Verse 2, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you do as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, that they have their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, I could preach a sermon a day for the next five days on that alone, but I won't. What I see here is that when we're starting to talk about the poor, when we're starting to talk about being a person that is giving to others, I mean, we're, we're a Christian nation. We like to give to other people, do we not? And as a church, we like to give to other people that are in need. But as the Bible says this, do it in a secret way. And you're like, what? That's weird, Jesus. And it says, don't be a hypocrite about it. Well, we have this thing in our mind. A hypocrite is what? Does anybody know? What's a hypocrite? The kids from camp are like, they're not hip with it. Yeah. What's a hypocrite? Say one thing and do another. Okay. What else? Not practicing what you're preaching. And that's pretty much, those kind of things are pretty much what we think of a hypocrite. But unfortunately, that's not what the Bible means by hypocrite. It means you're from Hollywood. Remember, we said that a couple weeks ago. A, a hypocrisy is a place that you learn how to be an actor. So don't be an actor. You're like, yeah, I've got a lot of drama kings and queens in my house. Don't be an actor when it comes to your religion because being an actor means that you're not sincere. And so Jesus in this little part of his sermon is talking about sincerity and your heart and let me tell you, I am sincere, and sometimes I do dumb things. Do you not? So when I'm trying to help somebody, I'm sincere sometimes and not helping them at all. But Jesus is not like that. You see, he sees need, and he doesn't just react, 
but he sees in front of the need and says, this is what you need. A lot of times we see soldiers and we think only one thing, do we not? We see war. But here we see what? One human helping another human. Kind of brings a tear to your eye sometimes because you see the genuineness of this soldier. You know that he's been trained to kill people, but he sees this little child, and what happens to your heart? It melts. <laughs> you're like, I don't care who you are. If you're in need, here's some food, because I like you, I love you. So, we see people in need now, and that they need compassion. You see, when people of no means or some means give with no expectation whatsoever, like we talked about a few weeks ago, it's amazing what this first part of this text starts to look like. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed. Does it say don't practice righteousness? No. It says don't practice it to show off. It says to practice it by all means, but do it with a pure heart and pure intentions. And sometimes we'll mess it up, but it's okay. Where's your focus? Hmm. How many of you have ever been following the Bitcoin thing? Some of you, I have no idea what a Bitcoin is. This is a way of doing commerce, and Bitcoin has gone up as far as $10,000 sometimes per Bitcoin and dropped as much as $3 per Bitcoin. It just kind of goes up and down. There was one man, and this is why I'm, I'm showing you this this morning. There was one man that had a computer that was alive during the early 90s and early parts of the 2000s. He had hundreds of Bitcoins because, you know, the first Bitcoin was used to buy a pizza, basically. There wasn't much value to it. Well, then when it started going up to like $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, some of them, I mean, People were going, hmm, bitcoins, let's sell them, whatever they are. They're kind of this thing out there, uh, machines crunching uh, all the time. Um, yeah, let's sell them. And one guy remembered, I used to have a computer, and it had like 150 bitcoins in it. The only problem is with that computer with 150 bitcoins is that it was a useless piece of junk because it was an old computer. So guess what he did with it? He threw it in the trash. It was in England, and he threw it in the trash, and it went to the landfill. And they estimated that that machine was worth quite a few million dollars. And so the man, he decided, well, you know, it might be, it might be good to go look for it. So he went to the place where the trash was dumped, and he started a quest to dig for that machine. How many of you like to go to the dump and dig through the dump? Oh, don't admit it. Don't admit it. There are some dump trucks that pull up and uh, makes me a little ill because of the smell. I'm just one of those people with smell. It's like, bleh. But he, he learned that his computer was worth millions upon millions of dollars. And we're talking not just a 10 or 20, 30, 40 million. It was millions, like hundreds of, thousands, hundreds of millions. And it's like, I've got to find that thing. And he dug and dug and dug. And you know what? I looked on the internet and I don't see that he ever found it. But it reminds you of a story, does it not? A story that was in the Bible. And for the kids, here's your extra credit today. Find this story. Okay? Find this story, write it down on a piece of paper where it's found, and I want you to give it to me afterward, okay? The story of a man who went into a field he was plowing, and as he was plowing, all of a sudden, boom, he hit something. And around here, it was probably a rock. I mean, I kid you not, when you're plowing, it's usually a rock, and you're like, oh, and there's usually piles of them on the edge of the field, or right in the middle of the field, depending on how big it is. But he hit something, and it didn't sound just right, so he went down to look, and as he looked, he saw this treasure chest, and he popped it open, and guess what? Woo, there was a lot of stuff in there, and he buried it back, and he put all the dirt back over it, and tried to remember in his head, and then he went to work, and he slave labor or whatever he had to do to buy that field. And after he bought that field, he celebrated because what? He was now a wealthy man. All because he 
took value in what was in that field. Before it was just a field, it was a place that he did labor. So kids, that's your, that's your job right now. Look up that one. Let me know afterward, okay? This story, as we read on, is an interesting sermon. Verse 5, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, actors, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues on the street corners so that they may be seen by all men. Truly I say to you that they have been rewarded in full. But you, when you pray, go into the inner part of your room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. I'm sorry, some of you friends that pray the same prayer over and over again, or uh, you repeat, repeat, repeat in your worship services. I'm sorry, I am not singling you out. It's just what's in the scripture. For they spouse that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Whoa. Do you realize that when you go to take that test, when you go to uh, go pay for that thing and you don't know if you have enough money or any of those things that you think are really kind of a halt in life, your father in heaven already knows it. What does that do for your faith? When Jesus is preaching this sermon, he's looking down at the people and he knows them and they don't even know that he knows them. And he's saying, don't worry. That's easier said than done, I know. Because I'm one of those that likes to worry. But let me take a, a little bit different look at things. If you look at the different characters in the Bible who exemplify not worrying or serving others. Let me put this one word to you. Esther. How many of you are thinking about Esther's life? Can you imagine what it was like for Esther to show up in front of the king unannounced and say, I have a favor to ask of you, and the favor was that you will spare my people. It wasn't easy for her. In fact, it took her two or three times. But she stepped in front of the king knowing that she could what? Die. And she did it. Because it was not only for her, it was for her people also. That's just one name. She gave even though she was going to die. Um, here's another word that we used to use, and it's kind of a funny word because kids, when I mention this, there's going to be a little bit of snickering. Okay, adults, this is just going to happen. Dorcas. He said dork. <laughs> but Dorcas or Tabitha. How many of you have something starting to swim around in your head? Some of you are like, I don't know who that is. Dorcas, she was one that was always busy helping others. She was the one that was always doing community service. She was the one always helping people in need. And she herself didn't have a whole lot, but she loved to give to other people. And she gave so much that one day she gave too much of herself. And she, I don't know what happened to her, but she passed away. The rest of the story is that God revived her through one of the disciples. But it's interesting that she gave and gave and gave and there was no expectation whatsoever except for to give. How many of us are like that? Not me. I'm not. Jesus himself said, the poor will you will always have with you. But I will not always be with you. And it's interesting that as we read along here and it talks about prayer, uh, verse 9, it says, pray then in a way that our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Remember? Do you remember this one? What's the thing? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgression, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your trespasses. That'll be another sermon. <laughs> that is deep. 
One of the biggest things right in the center of this is forgive other people no matter what, non-conditional. And I looked at that and I'm like, oh, that's impossible, dear Lord, because, and then I realized that Jesus did it. That while people were whipping him, while people were doing all kinds of things, he says, you're forgiven. And then I realized that I was inadequate. I realized that I was inadequate because I look and I said, Judas was so concerned with the neglect of money that um, even when Mary showed up, what did he do? We, st we studied about that a couple weeks ago. When Mary showed up with that expensive perfume, what happened? It be, should be sold and given to the poor, should it not? Hmm. That's not what he was after. He was after the fact that money was being misappropriated. And Jesus was like, you don't even understand because I'm about ready to pay for your salvation, son. And I know who you are. I know that I did not call you as a disciple. I did not call you to be one of my own but I accept that you're here because I am going to pay the price for you and you are going to betray me and I know it. How many of you, if you knew somebody was going to hurt you, would forgive them? Jesus, your sermon is too much. <laughs> Jesus, your sermon's too much. Wow, and this is only the center part of the sermon. If you want to read the rest of it, read 5, 6, 7 of Matthew. Verse 16, Whoever you, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, the actors. Do, um, for they neglect their appearance so that they will notice, be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, your reward is in full, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. That means clean yourself up. So that your fasting will be not noticed by men, but your father who is in secret and your father who does what is, uh, sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust does destroy and where thieves break in and steal and store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wait a minute. So let me ask you a question. Does this mean that we're not supposed to work and we're not supposed to make money? Does this mean that because I had food on my table today that I'm taking food away from somebody else? No. But it means it's time to focus. Focus on a way that God is wanting us to that is different than what we're used to. If God has everything on the no, not just on the earth. If God has everything because he created everything, what is the limitation of God? What is the limitation of God? So when we start spreading the gospel, we start t telling people about Jesus, where does it stop? It doesn't stop because who needs to hear the, the joy of Jesus Christ, him coming to the earth and dying and going back to heaven so that we may go back to heaven also? Where does that stop? It doesn't matter if the earth has twice as much population as it does now. It will never stop or deplete. And you know why that is? Because of you. Because of me. Because once we fall in love with Jesus Christ and once we start seeing that the treasuries of heaven are opened at our disposal and we start sharing our faith with other people, we suddenly realize that the money is not about the stuff that we hold in our hands, but it's about what we think about every day, what we do every day. And when you start telling people about the joys that God has given us and the joys of our relationship that we have with one another, it's amazing because one person hears you, two people hear you, lots of people hear you, and they're like, I want what you have because you have joy. And in this world we live in, joy is fake. It's only put on sometimes. I mean, how many of you, if I walk up to you, hey, how you doing today? Your natural response is just like mine. I'm doing great. I'm such a liar. <laughs> but when somebody smiles at you and shakes your hand and has genuineness, 
you all of a sudden realize there's a glimmer of Jesus. If you've been concerned with money like Judas has, I tell you today, it is true that money is something that is very important in the world we live in. But if God owns everything and we depend on him, there is always a way, always a way to make it till tomorrow. Some of you are like, yeah, I know so-and-so, they're worth a lot of money. Did you know that sometimes you can sin worse than they can if you have none? Do I need to say that again? If you have no money and you are despising people that have money, sometimes you're sinning worse than those that say, I'm going to hoard and not give to anyone. Because it's the love of money that ruins somebody, not money itself. And that's the wrong focus because what is money used for? Money is used to, in a church setting, proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. Nah, we don't do that though. Sometimes we just do it out of love and sometimes we don't always think through things but then God takes up all the stuff that we've been doing and be like, okay, I'm gonna do evangelism and we go and hold this big placard. We say, God is great. We're like, Psh. afterward we're like, <sighs> it did nothing. People just honked and some people were like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but God can even use some of our craziest things we do. And one person that was contemplating suicide saw that God is great that day and did not. How do you feel sometimes when you're in a crowd of people? If I'm reading Matthew 6 correctly and they're standing there, they're listening to Jesus, there's a lot of people listening to Jesus and there's not a whole lot of elbow room and if there was, they're all sitting down around, you're standing up, you're listening to the message and it's great, this is this guy, this guy is telling things that nobody ever talks about because we just want to keep the status quo. We don't want the Romans to come in and take everything and we don't want the people at the temple to take everything either, so we're just going to keep the status quo. So we do the fasting, we do the giving of, of offerings and things like that. What about charitable deeds, Pastor? Are charitable deeds good? Absolutely. But let me ask you, what's the reason why we're doing charitable deeds? Because in the sermon, if you read it, you find out that there are people that do charitable things, but the reason why they're doing charitable things is to fill a hole in their heart that only Jesus can fill. So what are charitable deeds? If you have somebody come through the front door and ask you for your coat jacket, what does the Bible say? Give them the coat, and what does it say afterward? Give them also, maybe the shirt, or in more correct, give them your outer cloak, too. Your suit jacket and your outer cloak. What are the conditions on that? None. And we go, okay, then you got to do that, Pastor. Every time somebody asks you for something, you got to give it without expectations. No, you got to be kind of wise, too. But the story behind the story is that you need to give with a pure heart. Because when somebody comes in on a bicycle with a backpack smelling not so good and you smell the booze on their breath, what do we automatically think? That person is worth less than a normal person. What the Bible is trying to teach here is that the people around you are all worth as much as you are. And that is a priceless commodity. And you say, oh, pastor, well, that's my niche then. I have this niche of doing this or I have this niche of doing that. It's great that each one of us has a niche, but that's not the whole story. The whole story is that we need to all care about people in a way that's a little different. How many of you care about your family? I do. <laughs> How many of you care about that one family member that irritates everybody? I do. <laughs> but it's love. It's compassion. And even the ones that annoy us the most, if they're our family, we love them anyhow. And we should treat everybody out there the same way as our family because they are inevitably future members of our family. Look at these pictures. It's kind of cool trying to do that with your hands. I, I see this a lot, and my heart doesn't look like a heart. It looks like a pear with a tail. But it's kind of cool. Love. 
And then you look up in the right-hand corner and you see the little girls loving on each other, their sisters. You know that that's not always the fact, but this is a cute picture. You see them draw about the love that they have for you and the joy that they have for you, and it melts your heart, and you're like, oh, this is really great. When we see our church family, it's kind of the same way. It's kind of a, it's, it's a wonderful time to just kind of contemplate things and look over things. A number of years ago, there was a geologist by the name of Dr. Williamson who was going through some work in a country called Tanzania. One day, he found himself dri- driving in a deserted area, slipping and sliding in rain-soaked roads. Suddenly, the four-wheel drive um, kind of sank to its axles in mud. I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but I tried to take my Suburban um, off-road, which was the dumbest thing I could have done in my life. Um, but I saw this really long mud pit thing, and I was like, yeah, I can make it. It's not a problem. I did not go and check how deep the mud was or anything like that. I thought, it's just that long. You can float right over the top if you go fast enough. It doesn't happen. I ended up really deep. It's called to the axles. To the axles where the mud is right up on top of where the uh, dirt never should be. <laughs> and uh, your truck is basically not going to move unless you get it out by towing it or pulling it out with somebody, you know, like a winch or something like that. Luckily, there was a Jeep behind us. Um, otherwise, we'd have been there for days because it was about mm, 20 some miles from the low, closest town. And that was walking over hills and everything like that. So as we're trying to get this truck out, I realized when I read this story, he was in a heap of a lot of trouble, especially if there was nobody to help him. He was mad. He was angry that he was actually stuck in this mud. He was kind of not, not happy at all. He was not used to doing the work that they were doing. They were digging out of the mud as much as possible. And I, how many of you have ever dug in the mud and were totally clean? That doesn't happen. But he was digging and digging and digging, and all of a sudden, he felt this really gritty big thing go clunk on his shovel, and he was like, oh, no, there's rocks under here. Well, that's not a bad thing if we get all the mud out. And he reached down and grabbed a clump of those rocks and was like, ah, and tried to squeeze it, and he hurt himself. Washed it off with water, and lo and behold, in a mud puddle in the middle of whatever was the road, or what they call a road, he found this stone. And I've got to read you the description of the stone because it's not a usual stone. It was pink. And it was some kind of stone. And being a geologist, he had to investigate. And as he removed more and more of the mud, he became more and more excited because as he finally cleaned it off, he was beside himself with joy. He was covered head to toe in mud. He had discovered in this place a beautiful pink diamond. He would have never, ever discovered that pink diamond if he hadn't been up to his axles in mud and covered in mud. Does it feel sometimes that we're covered up to our axles in mud in life and that we're all muddy and it's like, ah, and then all of a sudden God says, I have something for you. Do you treasure God? I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to the 24 of uh, Chapter 6 of Matthew there. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve two masters. So I got to go back up to 19. It says, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust is corrupt and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor dust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so that if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be covered in darkness. If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is, dark, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for one will love the other and hate the other. I mean, love one and hate the other. And one of them, if you read one of the texts, not only Matthew, it talks about mammon. Have you ever read that? You can't serve God and mammon. And I'm like, is that kind of like a mammoth and a person at the same time? It's, it's weird. And I looked it up and I'm like, I know what it is. I'm a pastor. It's money. No, it's not money either. It's treasure. It has more to do with not the coins that are in your pocket, but what you have in your heart that you want. You can't serve yourself and God. Woo. Heavy stuff, pastor. This is nuts. What are you trying to do to me? 
gluttony. We won't go there this time of year. Excessive materialism. Yeah, we won't go there this time of year either. Greed. Uh, we'll go there this morning. What is greed? Nothing is ever enough. Have you ever had that feeling? Nothing is ever enough. It feels like you need more and more and more and more. It doesn't matter if you're poor as a mouse or if you're rich as... We won't even say names. I have some family members. It doesn't matter. Greed can still be there. The desire for something that you do not have. And you know what? I innately think that God emplaced that in each one of us. And it's the desire for him. And sometimes we try and fill it full of everything else. Unjust or worldly gain. That's basically the same thing. If you're wanting something that is not yours... It's amazing. So, Pastor, what is the prescription that Jesus offered here? Well, in order to get the prescription totally, you have to read 5, 6, and 7, the chapters. I'll tell you that just bluntly this morning. But, join contentment. Philip Farm tells a story of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a fisherman lazily beside his boat. Why aren't you fishing, he asked. Caught enough fish already. It's like, what do you mean you caught enough fish already? I got what I need for my family and I. Well, why don't you want to, uh, you know, get a few more fish, sell them, and then, um, you know, you could have some extra money to buy some things that you might want. Like what? Well, you know, maybe a bigger boat so you can fish a little bit more and get more fish so you can make some more money. Why? Well, because if you do that, then you can buy some better nets, bigger nets, and then you can buy some more boats, and you'd have a fleet, and then you could tell the other guys what to do, and uh, then you'll have a lot of money, and then you'll be okay. Why? Well, so eventually you can just sit around and have a good time and, you know, not worry about anything. He goes, that's what I'm doing. The perspective we have sometimes about joy and contentment is totally skewed. Most of it's based upon financial gain. Financial gain this morning, however, I am not saying is a bad thing. Financial gain is given to us by God because we are able to do things with our hands or we're doing things with our minds. That is not a bad thing. That's a, a misnomer to think that if somebody has money that they're an evil person. Actually, the person that is evil is the one that's looking at others. Okay? Worry is the enemy. How many of you have worried this week, especially since it's five after? And by the way, I only have three more minutes. Don't worry about it. <laughs> How many of you have worried this week? Ah, most of us have. Philippians 4.6. Turn in your Bibles with me there, just briefly. Philippians 4.6. And when somebody says it, they can say amen, and actually, will you read it? Would you like to read it? Who said? Okay. 4-6. Wow. Be anxious for nothing. Either these is your said than done, Pastor. But in everything by prayer, not just praying, God, please give it to me, but supplication. God, I'm going to spend some time with you here. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to mull it over a little bit, and I'm going to be open to you, and I'm going to understand when you say no or yes or whatever you're going to say. Supplication, I'm going to be there. I'm going to kind of take some time with you and understand you. And with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. That reminds me of Lucas, how he used to pray. He'd be like, thank you, dear Jesus, for giving me this. And I'm like, I, he didn't say that. Uh, now I got to go get it. What do you mean, thank you? You haven't even asked for it yet. Well, it's expectation. And I'm sorry for embarrassing you, Lucas. Preachers and their sons and daughters, we embarrass them all the time. But with expectation, if we pray to God, it's almost like saying, thank you for doing it before he even did it. Let your request be known to God with that thanksgiving. And then in seven, it's interesting, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. 
worry. How many of you, if you were on top of the world, would have to worry? I'm acrophobic. That means I'm scared of heights. Being a youth director in the past, that was kind of a challenge, especially when you go rock climbing in the Black Hills. You look down and there's 200 feet underneath of you and you're like, uncomfortable. But when you're on top of the world, sometimes you don't look down at the nitty gritty. And it's easier to not worry. But Matthew 6, 25 to 30 says, don't worry about it because God has taken care of everything. Don't worry. The eye. How many of you have actually looked into, look at somebody's eye next to you. No, don't make weird eyes, but you know. Look at the eye of somebody next to you. And then look at the eye of the person next to them. Is it the same? No. In fact, when you look at eyes, it's interesting because some people can have like multiple colors, like green and blue and brown. I even met some from central part of uh, Central America that it looked like their eyes were black. It looked like they had pupils that were that big because the outer part was not brown. It was more of a deep, deep black. And it was beautiful. It was like, wow, that's kind of cool. But what does the eye say to you? Hmm? How do you look at the world? For instance, today, when you look up in the sky, what is it? It's kind of gray, isn't it? But you know it's sunshiny too, just above the clouds. How do you look at the world around you? How do you look... For others, um, do you look at them with a benefit? I wrote this a little incorrectly. It needs a comma. But do you look at others and think benefit for you? Do you look at this world with the desire to benefit you? Do you look at this world to benefit God? How do you look at the world? Do you look at it as a way that I can just an ends to a means? Matthew 20, and this is the last text today. Matthew 20, verses 30 to 34. Matthew 20, 30 to 34. And two blind men were sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out, Lord, have mercy on us. Son of David, the crowd sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus stopped and called them and said, what do you want for me to do for you? I thought it was pretty obvious. But they said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be open and move with compassion. Move with compassion. Jesus touched their eyes and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. What is it about sight that is so good? If I'm driving down the road and I see some trash beside the road, is that kind of gross? No, nah, not if I come back later and clean it up. If I see somebody sleeping on the side of the road, is that kind of gross? No, not if I actually help the person out and uh, see if they can get off the road. Sometimes they don't want to. I've had people that don't want to. But when you see the things around you, what do you see? Do you see it like Jesus? I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have light of the world. Have you ever walked in on one of these new LED um, street lights? It's really bright. And it can be as foggy as can be, and that thing will go through almost anything. It's beautiful. Have you ever been in a cave with a lantern and then turned it off? There's these things in front of your eyes that are not true. There's nothing in front of your eyes. You can wave your hand and you can't see it. What do you think those two men were talking about when Jesus healed them? What do you think that they were talking about to the people that asked, what in the world happened to you? How come you can see now? Telling is more than just telling what happened. The men were acting out in gratitude what Jesus did for them. And I want to believe that not only did they say, Jesus healed me, but they went, they got a job, they were productive, and then they started spreading the gospel about Jesus that healed them and made their eyes whole. And I imagine one of them became an artist, just because that's me. 
They loved life. They were showing that life was forever changed because Jesus touched their eyes. And then they started to see the sky. They started to see the things that were around them and started to show the glories of God to everyone around them. Have you ever seen something that looked like this? I have. How many of you have ever wanted to put it in a bottle? And kind of, well, some of you are like, yeah, I took my camera out and took a picture of it. It took 23 seconds exposure time with wide open aperture. But it's amazing that God's treasuries are something that we don't understand. As we read chapter six of Matthew, we find out that you and I are not to worry, but we're to go tell everybody that we are part of a treasury that has no end. So as this new year starts and you think, oh, you know, money, finances, all that kind of stuff, if I could only be inspired by the new year to treasure in my heart what I need to treasure and revel in the moment and feed positively the people around me and be a positive person myself, bottling the things that could help other people, wouldn't that be great? And God says, yes, because I'm the light of the world, but yet so are we. So are we. Let's bow our heads. So Father in heaven, we would like you to make us positive people that could be a driving force of your treasury, that we would collect a lot more people like us, that we would show them your loving mercy. And dear Father, that as you preached on that sermon on that mount, that you told us not to worry, but you said to cling to you. And dear Father, you said that you would take care of all that other stuff. Open our hearts, our minds, and our whole selves open today so then this new year we can let you work in us. And dear Father, thank you for being our God. Thank you for showing us the way, being the truth, and being the life. In Jesus' name, amen.